Now we're going to talk to two of the giants in the progressive movement. They've got a new plan. Uh, let's hear what that plan is and, and then talk through about how it can work. Uh, joining me now is Alan Minsky, he's the executive director of Progressive Democrats of America. And Harvey J. K., he's a professor emeritus of democracy and justice at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. Alan, Harvey, welcome. Thank Great you. to be here. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Harvey, uh, you're a, a fan and a professor of history. Um, and, uh, and so you guys came up with a plan that relates to FDR, uh, MLK, and, and others. So, tell us what the plan is and how it relates to those folks. Okay, so this is an economic bill of rights, a 21st century economic bill of rights. And it's grounded in, as you were pointing out, an American tradition, the American progressive tradition. It goes back to the New Deal when FDR began the New Deal with the idea of an economic declaration of rights. And in the course of his presidency set out to cultivate by way of the New Deal, the idea that Americans required and had a right to economic security. And in 1943, all with this idea in his head, the White House commissioned polls asking Americans what they wanted to see after the war. And roughly speaking, 85% of Americans wanted guaranteed health care, guaranteed employment, and guaranteed aid to students to enable them to go as far as their capacities could take them. Okay, high school, college, graduate school, professional school. The idea was guarantee their ability to pursue all of that. Now, FDR himself passed away in 1945, but this vision, this, this promise almost that he projected was not forgotten. In 1960, the Democratic Party actually built its platform on the promise of pursuing FDR's Economic Bill of Rights. A. Philip Randolph. Proposed in 1965 a freedom budget that followed the outlines of FDR's four freedoms and economic bill of rights. And then Martin Luther King Jr. not long before his, his death by assassination in 1968 issued a call for an economic bill of rights. The point is that it's there and the majority of Americans have always wanted this. This is not a, even specifically a democratic, progressive democratic left kind of thing. When I said 85% of Americans wanted these things, that included at least 75% of Republicans and 95% of Democrats. And we thought it was time to bring forward that idea because the polls show that Americans want these very kinds of things. The Democratic Party needs to pursue this kind of vision, needs to lay this out in the midst of a crisis of democracy, the only way to redeem and advance democracy is not simply to defend it, but to enhance it. Yeah, unfortunately, when we talk about history and we talk about the polling, it does get a little depressing because the American people are super clear. They have wanted universal health care for decades now, decade after decade after decade. The Democratic Party has said that they were in favor of it for decade after decade. And yet it still doesn't get done. So obviously there's something massively, massively wrong with our system, both for the Democratic Party and the media, because it takes you guys to point it out. Like what you know, that's why I love what you guys are doing. You're you're framing it as, hey, we all like FDR, right? We all like Martin Luther King, right? This is their idea. Um, but the media was like, oh no, it's radical. No, how could it be radical? That's just, it's absurd. How could, so is 85% of the American population radical? Anyways, as you can tell, I get worked up about it. Alan, you guys endorse a lot of progressive candidates. Uh, so help me understand uh, how this will help. Well, it is the final question in our 2022 uh, candidate questionnaire. Do you support this economic bill of rights? And so far, of course, we're, we're not gonna be endorsing any candidates that don't uh, check a yes on that. Um, I think all of us know, and most listeners of TYT know that I, the political reality we live in today, after the 2015-16 presidential election cycle, I feel there's a lot of ways you can look at the American two party system. But right now, I think it's very clear, very common sense to people that there are basically three political uh, major trajectories fit jammed inside the two party system. They're the Trumpian reactionaries on the far right. They're the, the neoliberal center that runs from the Romney wing of the Republican Party through the Clinton wing of the Democratic Party. And then they're the progressives. 
who burst on the scene with the Sanders campaign in 2016. And what we are making this as sort of like a, a you know, stake right in the ground to say we as progressives support this. We alone stand for and will not tolerate in our coalition anybody who does not stand for the economic transformation of American society along the lines that the American people want. And this is a declaration that will anchor that for progressives to make clear the distinction between neoliberals in the center, basically political conservatives, they want to conserve the current economic status quo, the reactionaries on the right, who really are just the complete corruption of Trump's promises that he made to the American public, which is no surprise there in 2015 and 16, because all he did is lower taxes on the wealthy and some minor trade adjustments when he was president with control of both houses of Congress, by the way. And then there are the progressives, and this is what we stand for. And we've laid out as succinctly as possible the economic measures and a clear vision of the economic transformation we want to see in American society, and that this is definitional for progressives. Okay, now now that we've established why it's a good idea, let me challenge you on it anyway. Um, so, so look on the right to comprehensive quality health care. Nobody's going to disagree. The overwhelming majority of the country agrees with us. Uh, the only people who don't agree with us are honestly just flat out corrupt. Uh, so, uh, they the politicians, the media that get paid uh, by the drug industries and the health insurance industries, uh, not most things in the in in the world are filled with nuance. Uh, this is not. This is black and white. Uh, American people have wanted it for time immemorial. It's in every other developed country. Everybody in media that tells you it's too expensive is flat out lying on behalf of uh, right. of corporations and corporate. It's world. a ma massively deflationary, in fact. Yes, cuts out a huge chunk. Right, saved it. If we were worried about inflation, let's get Medicare for all. It'll no, be on, a big solution to inflation. Yeah, on issues like that, there's. I, I'm tired of doing fake debates where we give right. facts and they give. Nonsense, like just right. absolute nonsense. But there are a couple of things here that uh, people might be curious about. So, Harvey, let me ask you about number eight here because we've got eight on here. The right to recreation and participation in public life. What do you all mean by that? Well, one could root it in the classic labor vision of the 24 hour day eight hours of work, eight hours of rest. Eight hours for what we will. When FDR was proposing this, he had had a commission. The National Resources Planning Board, they actually had a fascinating word. They said the right to adventure. Hmm. Imagine that, okay, <laughs> the right to adventure. I love that. I, I, I almost tried to talk Alan into including that word in there. But the right to, to recreation, it, it's to get out, to be able to enjoy yourself. You know, FDR's vision of an economic bill of rights was actually rooted in the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Think of recreation as that additional trajectory towards the pursuit of happiness. So, uh, first of all, a lot of funny things in there. You know, when you frame it that way, it is kind of funny that when we say, hey, wouldn't it be nice if you had a right to recreation and to enjoy your life, right? <laughs> the media generally says, <laughs> no. You should be miserable. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you try yeah. to be happy? No, you don't have a right to that. Okay, but I, I assume, Harvey, just to finish that thought, you mean to have enough resources and, and enough protection at work to be able to work eight hours and have enough, um, you know, resources, etc., to be able to enjoy the other. Uh, oh, absolutely. As you as you will have noted, early on we say a primary right in this economic bill of rights is the right to a job with a living wage, a living wage. And, and it's really fundamental to FDR when he signed into law the National Industrial Recovery Act in 1933, which had the first federal minimum wage. He actually said, no company should be allowed to operate in the United States that does not pay a living wage. So he was already looking forward to that development. So a living wage, would be able to one would be able to afford life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness and especially when you imagine a shared collective quality healthcare in America and also public education as far as students are capable of pursuing it it's it's hard not to enjoy harvey um because he reminds us of the things that are obvious uh, that we have forgotten because of the brainwashing it's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's in the founding documents. 
And yeah, now, exactly. if you said, hey, this should be a right to adventure, they'd you know, evacuate from you from the building in a democratic uh, organization, <laughs> right? And they'd be like, oh, right. that's, that's radical, you can never win. FDR won four elections, four presidential elections, what do you mean you can't win? Uh, uh, let's, let's put this out to the American public and see if they reject it. Right. I think they'll embrace it, right? Yeah, exactly. Alan, here's another one though uh, that, that I have a question about. Number six, the right to a meaningful endowment of resources at birth and a secure retirement. Secure retirement, I get Social Security clear, right? Mm -hmm. What do you mean an endowment of resources at birth? Well, we drew on the work of a bunch of people as we developed this. And one was an article from American Prospect in 2018 by three economists, uh, William Darity, Mark Paul, and Derek Hamilton. And one thing that they have championed, Hamilton in particular, is the idea of, of baby bonds. Well, okay, leaving aside that particular proposal, the idea is, as everybody knows, in the United States of America, we are not born into this life with equal opportunities. Some people are to the manner born, very few, and the most of us are born with very little. And oftentimes in households in very, very bad and dire economic situations. So it is along the lines of what was just very popularly put forward, which is, what was it, $300 per child under a certain age and $250 per month per child over a certain age. We just had this in the United States. I think it was tremendously popular. So it would fit in that mold or something along baby bonds. But again, the idea that when people come into this life, they're not born into poverty, that there is some provision for each child born so that they have the opportunity to uh, not be uh, born into dire uh, social and economic circumstances. Yeah, and by the way, the child tax Take credit. It, 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 hmm. I wanna also add to that, somebody very near and dear to your heart and mine. This was an idea that we actually drew upon as well from Thomas Paine, who was the visionary of Social Security. And he had spoken of the need not only for what we came to know as old age pensions and Social Security for, the, for, for those in re, to retire. He also said that young people should be afforded a grant of money to enable them to get a start in life. And that that was a fundamental way to combat poverty. Yeah, the child tax credit was uh, above 70%, I think around 75% in popularity. And right. so I just gave you the audience, the two of the most controversial ones on the platform. The other eight, or the other six are 70, 80, 90% in approval rating. And yet we can't get the Democratic Party to do it, let alone the Republican Party. And that's the sorry state of affairs right now. But Harvey K and Alan Minsky are trying to fix it. So thank you guys. For the effort and thank you for coming on and talking about it. Thank you, Jake. Thank you so much. No problem. Great to be here. Thanks for watching The Young Turks. I really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that. All you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video, thank you.